The relationship between police officers and an inmate is unequal. Where the police have access to information and freedom, inmates are restricted and have limited access to information. It becomes very puzzling when you hear about criminals and convicted felons having relationships with police officers and some even finding love while behind bars. From getting pregnant to planning escapes, here are seven police officers who fell in love with inmates. Vicky White one of the most famous news stories on the internet about an officer having a relationship with an inmate is the case of Vicky White, a correction officer who had a thing for a younger 38-year-old inmate, Casey White. Take note that Vicky and Casey White weren't related. The Lauderdale County Sheriff's Office stated that investigators spoke with inmates at the jail and confirmed there was a special relationship between Vicky and Casey White. However, the exact details of the relationship were not revealed. Experts say there is a term for this kind of attraction, sometimes referred to in our culture as bad boy syndrome, hybristophilia is the attraction to and or sexual interest in those who commit crimes, particularly heinous and violent crimes such as rape and murder, explained Dr. Casey Jordan, a criminologist and professor of justice and law administration at Western Connecticut State University. Vicki White surely believes she's in love with Casey White because he gives her a feeling of being alive after decades of feeling staid, safe and reliable, Jordan added. After spending 25 years working for the Lauderdale County Sheriff's Office, Vicki White, a 56-year-old corrections officer, decided it was time to retire. Everyone liked, respected, and trusted her, so nobody suspected that her retirement was hiding a plan. Just before retiring, Vicky sold her house for less than $100,000, which was less than half of its actual market value. On her final day at work, she told her colleagues that she had to accompany a prisoner to a regular mental health appointment. The prisoner was Casey, a person with a criminal record and suspected of murder. It was a bit unusual for a prisoner to be escorted by just one officer, but nobody paid much attention to it. Remember that trust thing? Vicky and Casey White fled, but after 11 days, the police located them in Evansville, Indiana. Vicky chose to take her own life to evade capture. Further investigations revealed that the two Whites had been involved in a romantic relationship since 2020. They had managed to keep it hidden, and Vicky was the mastermind behind their escape plan. Singleton mentioned that Vicky had been an outstanding employee, boasting 17 years of a spotless record with not a single negative incident in her personnel file. She was admired and respected by her co-workers and her subordinates, he said. It's just been a total shock. The situation shocked friends, family, and everyone who knew her, as it suggested that she might have grown fond of a man accused of murder and potentially assisted him in evading authorities. Experts pointed out that the close interaction between staff and inmates, the absence of privacy for prisoners, and the relationship between female staff and male inmates in correctional facilities can lead to inappropriate bonds forming. Brenda Smith, a law professor at American University and the director of the Project on Addressing Prison Rape, described it as a very common story. Smith stated his thoughts on the sort of construct of supervision in the settings that could create the environments and the opportunities for such acts. Smith further pointed out that these facilities have a sexualized atmosphere, causing male inmates to have limited privacy, while female staff members frequently face sexual harassment from inmates or even other staff. Irrespective of the specific details of Vicky and Casey White's relationship, Smith emphasized that the incident brings attention to certain shortcomings in jail conditions. Specifically, there seems to be a culture that doesn't treat a relationship between a female staff member and a male inmate as seriously as it would if the genders were reversed with a male employee and a female inmate. I think that it really bears a harder look at what's going on in the institution, and not only for prisoners, but also what's going on for staff as well, she said. Such a relationship harms the integrity of the system, according to her. She pointed out that if an officer could easily walk away with a prisoner, it highlights a more extensive problem of safety within the institution that should concern everyone. But Vicky was not alone. A quick look at the history of some very notorious murderers and serial killers shows they had large fan followings, and many of them got married to their fans while in prison. Prison. Stephanie Smithwhite. In February 2020, a British judge described Curtis Warren as a major league offender, and that description certainly fits him well. Warren had built a criminal empire centered around drug operations, from which he earned substantial profits. He was even likened to Britain's version of Pablo Escobar. Disguised under the seemingly respectable business, Warren's success was significant enough to land him a spot on London's The Sunday Times Rich List. At the time of the judge's statement, Warren was already serving a 13-year prison sentence for his involvement in drug importation conspiracies. As if that wasn't enough, he received an additional 10-year sentence for failing to repay nearly £200 million generated from his illicit drug business. Warren had already been convicted of manslaughter for killing another inmate while he was in a Dutch jail. It appeared that even from behind bars, he managed to run his group's criminal activities. Warren was the perfect example of a manipulative prisoner, always seeking to exploit a vulnerable guard. He exhibited those traits by somehow wooing and starting a relationship with Stephanie Smithwhite, one of the prison official. He was even able to seduce other prison staff members.
prisoners. Despite receiving training on dealing with manipulative and corrupt prisoners, Smith White couldn't resist his charm. Warren had three demands from Smith White, sex of course, but more importantly, information about the prison's security system and smuggling contraband into the prison facility. As time passed, they engaged in kissing and oral activities, and Smith White sent Warren a provocative picture of herself wearing a cat suit. The steamy tryst lasted for six months, from June to December 2018. Smith White developed such strong feelings that she got a tattoo of Warren's name alongside a rose on her body. Allegedly, the 42-year-old even made a hole in her trousers so the pair could have quick intercourse whenever they felt the urge. When the prison staff grew suspicious, they launched a surveillance operation. At first, Smith White vehemently denied everything, but substantial evidence pointed to a romantic involvement. She also denied any sexual purpose behind the hole found in her prison uniform trousers, but Judge Jonathan Carroll said it was hard to imagine why else it was there. The pair were also caught with more than 450 filthy notes detailing their sexual fantasies, concealed at a relative's business, and a copy of Warren's autobiography titled Cocky, The Rise and Fall of Curtis Warren, hidden in Smith White's residence. Warren even attempted to eat one of the explicit love letters when he was caught with it. Investigators discovered a small white Samsung phone in her car, described as no larger than a pound two coin, which had only dialed one number, traced back to Franklin Prison. No prizes for guessing whose. Investigators also found evidence of 213 calls exchanged between them within a mere three months. The disgraced officer eventually confessed to investigators, revealing that he had developed an unhealthy obsession with her and would frequently call her from his cell to seek her attention. Smith White admitted to two charges of misconduct in a public office. The first charge was related to their sexual relationship, which was reported to have lasted from June to December 2018. The second count pertained to her failure to report that she was aware of his access to a phone. Judge Jonathan Carroll stated, Your conduct represents the very most grave breach of trust placed in you. Andrew Nixon, who was defending Smith White from Bolden Colliery, South Tyneside, argued that she had made a disastrous mistake in judgment. He further added, This is a woman who has fallen in love with the wrong person. Smith White was sentenced to two years for her misconduct and for failing to report that Warren had access to a phone. During interviews with detectives, she expressed feeling devastated but remained hopeful that there might still be a slight possibility that their relationship could continue. Violating a serious crime prevention order is considered a criminal offense and can lead to a maximum sentence of five years in prison, an unlimited fine, or both. Warren, who had a previous net worth of approximately £200 million, was released on bail while further investigations were conducted, as reported by The Mirror. Kelly Jacobs. This is the story of a prison guard who was never employed in the same prison where her lover was serving time. In fact, they were in completely different countries. Kelly Jacobs resided in the Netherlands and was engaged to a prisoner incarcerated in Oregon, USA. With her background in the prison service, Jacobs expressed her desire to gain deeper understanding into the lives of inmates and how they experienced their confined existence. To achieve this, she visited a website that encouraged people to correspond with prisoners among the various options. Available, she chose James Wyatt Dental simply because he was smiling in his picture. Jacobs started writing with Wyatt out of curiosity, never imagining she would find love with a convict. Previously employed at a correctional facility, she wanted to understand more about the inmate experience, their emotions and thoughts. Their correspondence began in 2019, and they remained in constant contact through numerous letters, emails, and instant messages. Over time, their pen pal connection blossomed into a romance. I wasn't picky, I just chose someone who looked friendly. After a while, we started calling and having video calls and using direct messenger, we would message each other for hours every day, Jacobs mentioned in a Newsflare video that went viral. The infatuated social work graduate admitted she was initially afraid and attempted to resist her feelings for dental, fearing their relationship might take an unwanted turn. However, over a few months, they both acknowledged their love and chose to become engaged. They even had their initials tattooed on their fingers. At first, Jacobs's parents were doubtful about the situation, but according to Newsflash, they came to appreciate her future husband. Wyatt even wrote a letter to Jacobs' dad, seeking his daughter's hand in marriage, and he made arrangements with a Dutch jeweler to send an engagement ring to Jacob's house. He proposed to her through a video call, and they decided to get married inside the prison in October 2021, which was more than 10 years before Wyatt's release date. Jacob's parents approved of their relationship, and the couple had plans to live together and start a family once Wyatt was released. He proposed with a prison-made ring, but then he had someone in the free world order a ring at a jeweler for me, Jacobs, who was hoping to work in psychiatry now that she is a graduate, said in the video. For the wedding, I won't wear a traditional fancy dress because people don't do that for prison weddings. I will probably just wear a simple white dress or white trousers or a white skirt and top, she added. The only person with second thoughts about their relationship is Jacob's protective older brother, although she is convinced that he will come around and approve once he meets her cell block soulmate. Wyatt, who has been serving a 20-year sentence, 
sentence at the Snake River Correctional Institution in Oregon, was convicted of assault and unlawful use of a firearm following a bar brawl in 2012. He was with a girlfriend. They were at a bar, and they got attacked by five strangers. He tried to protect himself and his girlfriend, so he pulled a gun and shot four of them, but none of them died, Jacobs explained. The couple has never been in the same room, and even after getting married, they won't be able to have private visits because it's not allowed in Oregon. It will take a while before they can start living together as a married couple, since Wyatt's earliest release date is 2032. Despite receiving some negative comments online about their uncommon love affair, Jacobs said that most of the feedback has been positive. She mentioned how she'd received lots of negativity online about it, with people saying things like, how could you be with a criminal? He'll get out and then murder you. Jacobs expressed that she will never support or approve of Wyatt's actions, but she doesn't want to pass judgment on him as a person based on his past. Being in prison doesn't always mean someone is a bad person, just as being a free man doesn't always guarantee that he is a good one. Nancy Gonzalez. On February 18, 2013, prison guard Nancy Gonzalez was arrested for allegedly engaging in sexual relations with Ronald Wilson during her night shift at the Metropolitan Detention Center, which is illegal. Gonzalez and Wilson met while he was in jail, and their intense relationship resulted in her getting pregnant a few months into their affair, as mentioned in court documents. During the court proceedings, a two-minute video was presented showing their encounter in a prison activity room. Additionally, another prisoner claimed that he witnessed Gonzalez standing near Wilson's cell, and when she moved Moved away, his pants were down around his ankles. Wilson was a young member of a gang on Staten Island when he got arrested for shooting undercover officers James Nemerin and Rodney Andrews at close range during an illegal gun sting operation that went wrong. In 2003, Wilson was found guilty and initially received a death sentence in 2006. However, in 2010, the court overturned the death penalty. Prosecutors made another attempt, but in 2016, a judge ruled that Wilson had a mental disability and the Eighth Amendment prohibited his execution. On the day of the trial, Gonzalez admitted to a judge that she knew it was unlawful to have a sexual relationship with an inmate under her supervision, her lawyer, Anthony. Rico referred to Romeo and Juliet, attempting to explain how his client still feels love for Wilson. People find love in all places, Mr. Rico said. There are some people who may understand that, and there are some people who may not. According to sources cited by the New York Post, it was revealed that while trying his luck with Gonzalez the previous year, Wilson was also making romantic phone calls to three other women while behind bars. In a recorded conversation with another inmate discussing Wilson, she expressed how she took a chance because she was so vulnerable and wanted to be loved. Following Gonzalez's arrest, as she was suspected of plotting with Wilson to help him evade punishment, Rodney Andrews, the father of one of the slain officers, spoke out against the notion that his son's killer should be shown leniency simply because he impregnated the woman. Put him to death for what he did, Rodney Andrews Sr. told New York Daily News. If he had 20 children, it wouldn't change my mind. The 72-year-old father expressed that nothing would change his mind, even if the person responsible had many children. The Gonzalez and Wilson saga didn't end there. In November 2013, Gonzalez temporarily lost her parental rights to the infant son she conceived with Ron L. Wilson while they were inside the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn, New York. Gonzalez stated that relatives of Ron L. Wilson had gotten her intoxicated during two family gatherings the previous summer, where she brought the baby shortly after his birth. Due to her being charged federally for engaging in sexual activity with a prisoner, Gonzalez, who was in recovery for substance abuse, was strictly prohibited from consuming alcohol as a condition of her bail release. Unfortunately, shortly after giving birth, she lost custody of her baby due to neglect. Gonzalez had a very troubled childhood, but the court ruled that this couldn't be used as an excuse and sentenced her to one year in custody. Her defense lawyer noted that the offense arose from her lifelong struggle and inability to make appropriate decisions regarding her sexual conduct. He had also mentioned that she had a misguided emotional belief that becoming pregnant by Wilson would give him a lasting purpose in his otherwise tragic and dysfunctional life. Reportedly, Wilson's family wanted Gonzalez to testify about the upcoming birth of their son during Wilson's sentencing to help him avoid the death penalty. However, Gonzalez declined to do so. In a plea for leniency before Gonzalez's sentencing on November 15, 2013, Rico stated that Gonzalez suffers from mental health problems due to being a victim of sexual molestation and rape by her stepfather, uncles, and other men since childhood. She also revealed that Gonzalez had engaged in sexual relations with at least eight jail staff members, both male and female, during her two-year tenure as a guard. During the investigation, authorities believed that Wilson, while awaiting sentencing, manipulated Gonzalez into conceiving his child with the intention of using the baby later on to argue against imposing the death penalty. Gonzalez was potentially facing up to 16 months in prison, but she was also eligible for probation. In the end, in February 2014, she received a sentence of one year and a day in federal prison.
Lucy Thornton. Inappropriate relationships are not exclusive to the United States alone, as we can find an example in England with Lucy Thornton. Lucy confessed that from November 30th, 2018 to August 1st, 2019, she engaged in willful misconduct by having an inappropriate relationship with Aaron Whitaker and encouraging him to use a mobile phone while he was in prison. During questioning, Lucy admitted that she and Aaron had developed mutual feelings in February 2019. He gave her his number so they could communicate when she was off duty. She claimed that she contacted Hayden Whitaker as a friend and also stayed in touch with their mother. Lucy's arrest took place on July 31st, 2019, and she was formally charged on March 11th, 2021. The case resulted from a joint investigation involving the Northwest Regional Organized Crime Unit, NWROCU, and the Counter-Corruption Unit of Her Majesty's Prison and Probation Service, HMPS. Aaron and Hayden Whitaker, who live in Macclesfield, Cheshire, have built up troubling criminal records since their youth. When Aaron was 19, he was sent to Thorn Cross's Young Offenders Institution in Warrington for causing grievous bodily harm, GBH. However, in September 2010, he managed to escape from the institution by jumping out of a window, although he was later apprehended while attempting to hitchhike. In October 2011, he received an additional two months of imprisonment for the escape. It was said that the 21-year-old attempted to flee because he couldn't afford to pay off gambling debts that had accumulated since he started serving his sentence for GBH. Subsequently, in 2018 and 2019, Aaron was sent to HMP Alt Course after violating his parole for another undisclosed offense. In a separate incident, Lucy, presumably a friend or associate, transferred pound 200 into a bank account to settle a drug debt on his behalf after learning that Aaron had received threats, as mentioned during the court proceedings. On the other hand, Hayden was imprisoned for 10 years in October 2013 because he attacked a man with a kitchen knife on the street in Macclesfield, shocking the onlookers. In March 2019, the police issued a warning urging people to stay away from Hayden, who was 26 years old at the time and wanted for recall to prison after being released. They advised the public to watch out for a tattoo of the name Kaylee on the right side of his neck and not to approach him due to his dangerous nature. He was captured shortly after and sent back to HMP Alt Course. However, in April 2019, he committed another assault while in prison, leading to an additional 12 weeks of imprisonment. Hayden has since been relocated to HMP Lancaster. The brothers and Lucy secretly exchanged hundreds of calls and texts using smuggled phones. The prison security governor became aware of rumors suggesting something improper was going on and decided to interview Lucy. In June 2019, Lucy got suspended from her job due to a play fight with another inmate. During the incident, officers witnessed her rolling around on the floor with the prisoner on top of her at times, according to the Liverpool Echo. Subsequently, she got arrested the next month and the authorities found a phone with Aaron's contact number saved as my baby at her address in Warrington. After Aaron was released from prison on parole, Lucy became pregnant. She gave birth to a baby in August 2020, but unfortunately, that didn't prevent her from receiving a 10-month prison sentence. During the court proceedings, Anthony O'Donoghue, the defense attorney, stated, her ex explanation is she fell in love with the wrong person in the wrong place, and I suppose in the tides of men and women, these things can happen, inappropriate and totally wrong though they are. O'Donoghue emphasized that Lucy had a commendable character, but this case had severely damaged her future prospects. In the end, the judge handed down a 15-month sentence, reduced by a third as a result of her guilty plea. Lynette Barnett. This story features the Crossroads Correctional Center, established in 1997 to house up to 1,500 inmates. Among the staff members who joined from the beginning was Lynette Barnett. In 1999, one of the prisoners at the facility was Terry Banks. Terry Banks, originally from Benton Harbor, Michigan, had been convicted of first-degree murder in 1995 in Greene County, located in southwestern Missouri. He received a life sentence without the possibility of parole for the fatal shooting of Tim Eastburn from Rocky Comfort, Missouri. Despite the circumstances, Lynette Barnett an officer at the correction center, developed feelings for Terry Banks, and they together devised a plan to escape. They shared a number of similarities that drew both of them close to each other. The two were said to share similar red hair, although Lynette's hair was bleached blonde. Terry had a tattoo of a Tasmanian devil on his left arm, while Lynette owned three Rottweilers, one of which she named Taz. Also, both Terry and Lynette experienced parental divorces and remarriages, and they both dropped out of high school, finding common ground in their backgrounds. Nine days before the escape, security footage captured Terry and Lynette, and entering a storage room while holding hands. On their way back, just before reaching the main room, they let go of each other's hands. She was infatuated, said FBI agent Kurt Lipanovich. If you want to say she's in love, fine. He's in love with his freedom. In October 1999, she managed to sneak a fake police ID and a spare guards uniform into the prison. Surveillance video from the Maximum Security Center showed Banks leaving the entrance calmly. However, the FBI caught up with them two months later when they were residing in a trailer park in Victoria, Texas. A viewer who saw a segment about the couple on America's most 
Most Wanted reported their whereabouts to the authorities. Love is the force that led Terry to imprisonment, and love is what granted him a fleeting taste of freedom, a seven-week pursuit that culminated on a misty December morning in Victoria County, Texas. At the age of 19, Terry encountered Sheena Eastburn at a bar in the nearby town of Rocky Comfort. He became enamored with her and pledged to fulfill her every desire. Tragically, she wanted her drug-dealing husband eliminated. On November 19, 1992, Terry, accompanied by his friend Matt Myers, went to Tim Eastburn's residence with the intention to rob and murder him. Terry fired the initial shot from outside the house, while Matt proceeded to fire another bullet into Tim's head inside the premises to ensure his demise. Matt decided to cooperate with the authorities and became a state's witness, which led to his charge being reduced to second-degree murder. He received a 67-year sentence as a result. On the other hand, both Sheena and Terry were found guilty of first-degree murder and received life sentences without the possibility of parole. He was raised upright, Charlie, Terry's father said. He just fell in with the wrong girl. According to the authorities, Banks and Lynette left Crossroads at approximately 4 p.m. on October 29, 1999, in Lynette's pickup truck. That same night, Lynette cashed her $1,400 paycheck at a liquor store in Kansas City. Relatives of Banks sold Lynette's black pickup truck to a woman in Joplin for $2,000 on November 18, 1999. The truck was discovered in the Joplin area on December 3rd of the same year. Banks and Lynette were apprehended peacefully at around 7.30 a.m. in a trailer park, as stated by FBI spokesman Jeff Lanza. Banks' father was also taken into custody on Saturday morning in Victoria, according to Lanza, but he was not charged. The FBI, local police, sheriff's officers, and officials from the Texas Department of Public Safety were involved in the capture. The pair were found in a recreational vehicle parked next to a trailer, according to Lanza. Lynette received the maximum punishment of a five-year sentence for aiding a prisoner's escape. Missouri State Reverend Randall Relford introduced a bill during the January session to change Lynette's alleged crime to a Class B felony, carrying a five- to 15-year prison term that could be extended to 30 years. He believed that a harsher punishment was necessary for someone convicted of murder. At least it ought to be the same as the person who had escaped, Relford said. Despite the legal status, Lynette and Dave were still married. After watching the videotapes, Dave came to the conclusion that Terry Banks was the reason their marriage fell apart. He grew tired of dealing with reporters like Lynette and preferred not to engage with strangers, so he decided to write a book. Perhaps that way, people would stop bothering him, he hoped. Dave admitted that he had much to say to Lynette, but they hadn't spoken since she ran away. As an officer at the Western Missouri Correctional Center, he was prohibited from having personal interactions with offenders. Even if his wife had broken that rule, he vowed not to do the same. Bobby Parker. In September 1981, Randolph Dial, a skilled artist and sculptor, was given a life sentence for murdering a karate instructor in Oklahoma. In 1986, while intoxicated, Dial confessed to the murder, stating that it was a contract killing for the mob. In August 1986, he received a life sentence for the crime. However, in 1994, he managed to escape and remained on the run for 11 years. Finally, in 2005, authorities captured him and returned him to prison, where he passed away in 2007. The details of his escape have a hint of true romance. The prison ward in Granite, Oklahoma, resided in a house on the prison grounds. While Dial was in prison, he had a tendency to create elaborate fantasies. He would write letters to his friends, sharing captivating stories about his supposed exploits in Vietnam as part of the Delta Force or his involvement with the CIA, Secret Service, and FBI, as reported by the Washington Post. At the same time, right next to the Oklahoma State Reformatory in Granite, Bobby Parker resided with her husband, Deputy Warden Randy Parker, and their two daughters, aged 8 and 10. Interestingly, one of the inmates at the medium security facility near by was none other than a person named Randolph Dial. Dial had managed to get special privileges within the reformatory, allowing him to stay in a minimum security housing unit outside the prison walls. He used his persuasive skills to convince the officials to let him start an arts program to raise funds for rehabilitating inmates. He set up a ceramic studio in the Parker's garage, and Bobby Parker, who was not a guard but responsible for monitoring Dial, often volunteered and spent time alone with him in the studio. Then, one day, both Parker and Dial disappeared. However, thanks to a tip from America's Most Wanted on April 4, 2005, the police located them in Camp Tide, Texas, where a local recognized Dial from the show, just like in the Lynette Barnett's case. As the police entered a mobile home situated on a rural chicken farm in the Piney Woods near the Louisiana border, they found Dial and Parker living under false names, Richard and Samantha Dale. Dial was arrested peacefully, but officers noticed a loaded pistol on the table and a shotgun near the door. Dial confessed that he had threatened Parker's family, but claimed he never intended to carry out his threats. Meanwhile, in Texas, investigators from the Oklahoma State Bureau
Bureau of Investigation made puzzling discoveries inside the mobile home on the chicken farm. They found that Parker had been driving to a grocery store in Center, Texas every few weeks to cash her paychecks and buy supplies. From there, she could have easily driven away or sought help from the Shelby County Sheriff's Office, which was conveniently located right across the street from the grocery store. In 2004, Dial suffered a heart attack and was urgently taken to the hospital. It appeared to be another perfect chance for Parker to run away, but instead, she chose to write him a heartfelt letter and stood by his side. On the day Parker disappeared, a former inmate who was working on the reformatory grounds testified that he saw Parker leave with Dial in the family minivan. He looked surprised when she drove past him. Up until Dial's death, he insisted that he had kidnapped Parker and coerced her into assisting him. However, the authorities didn't believe his account. Then, in April 2008, Parker was arrested and faced felony charges for aiding Dial's escape from prison. It took an additional three years for the trial to take place. During the trial, the prosecution claimed that Parker was romantically involved with Dial and had assisted him in his escape. On the other hand, Parker's defense attorneys argued that Dial had drugged her, abducted her, and subjected her to multiple incidents of rape. Eventually, Bobby Parker was sentenced to one year in prison for helping Dial escape. She served six months of her sentence and was released on April 6, 2012.